Okay, so we're talking about intelligence today, and intelligence has a very controversial history, and still does. Even the present has some controversy to it as well, and we'll talk about that in this section. So thinking and intelligence. Cognition, thought processes, cognition, your thinking processes, are the mental processes involved in thinking, knowing, perceiving, learning, and remembering, and also the contents of those processes too. What is it that you're thinking? Uh, have any of you stopped at some point and tried to think about what it is you're actually thinking instead of just letting the brain determine what it is that is going through it? And even when I'm talking to you, I'm not really sure what it is the next word's coming out of my mouth, but it's just a string of process, a, str a, a flow of information. And sometimes it gets stuck, and then I can't, can't get it out of my head. Uh, but I, can't, I don't think about what it is that I'm saying. Well, sometimes you can actually stop and just think about what it is you're thinking about. And, and notice that you're thinking about thinking about thinking. <laughs> and it's, it gets kind of interesting. Uh, intelligence is the mental capacity not just to acquire knowledge, which is what the IQ determines is how much you know compared to the other people of your age, but also to use that knowledge to reason and to solve problems effectively is part of intelligence. And hopefully when you went to that discussion, you actually noticed uh, what it was that intelligence was and that you read my response as well about intelligence. So metrics is how you measure something. Psycho is for the psychology. So psychometrics is the, is measuring psychological traits. That's not just intelligence, it's all kinds of other types of traits too. Your personality, your skills, your beliefs, your mental abilities. And I'll have some of those tests that you can take to determine what kind of skills or mental abilities or personalities you have later in the class. This is a picture of the thinker uh, by Rodin. And, it, and it's we're talking about thinking, so that's what he's doing. Supposedly, he's thinking. My favorite is a picture of a monkey who's doing the same thing, but he's also holding a human skull as he's looking at it. It's kind of an interesting take on Rodin. So cognition or thinking involves manipulation of mental representations, such as concepts, images, schemes, and scripts. And we'll talk about all of those types of things. It is a cognitive process involved in forming a new mental representation by manipulating the information you have in your brain, which means that it's different for you as it is to another person because it's manipulating what you know, and you know different things than another person knows. I'll talk about that in a minute too. The brain area that's most associated with common sense, with judgment making, with intuition, that's something that a lot of people don't recognize, intuition knowledge that you have that just sort of flows together and all of a sudden you know the answer, but why did you know the answer? Because you had all the pieces you needed, intuition. Controlling cognition and controlling your emotions. And that appears to be the frontal lobe just above the eyes, the frontal lobe of the brain, both sides. It controls emotions, thinking, judgments, all kinds of stuff. But it is not fully developed until the age of 18 to 21, and that's why there's a controversy over whether you're an adult at 18 or whether you're an adult at 21, and what else it means to be an emerging adult in the United States. And every country is a little bit different. Some countries in the United States, we, we've already talked about the fact that we determine what an adult is by certain things about their life? Do they have their own place? Do they have, are they married? Do they have children? And yet that's very difficult to do because there are people that don't meet that standard. Yes, we have the normal distribution curve, but in other countries they say 18 and you are an adult. That's it. You're 18, you're an adult. So concepts are mental representations of categories of items that share something in common or ideas based on experience. That's what a concept is. You have concepts of your life, of how the world works. You have a reasonable expectation that the world is going to work a specific way because of your concepts. If your concepts are well off the normal path, beaten path, then you're going to think the world works a little bit differently than it really does. Children are really interesting because they will group together things that 
we as adults know are separate. For instance, birds and airplanes are all grouped together as equal because they don't make the distinction one is made by man, the other is, is made by God, and they both fly, so they're, then they both belong together. And so that's, uh, that's problems with con concepts. Uh, natural concepts are the imprecise mental classifications that we make, and prototypes are the typical or ideal form. We'll talk about that in just a second. Artificial concepts we'll talk about as well, created by rules of math and specific definitions. And we will talk about algorithms and heuristics in this class. And concept hierarchies are lists that go from general to more specific. And I will show you one to give you an indication of what a concept hierarchy is. But it will have flaws in it purposely so that I can talk about the differences, what makes a good concept hierarchy, and why our brain is not very good at putting together a certain information. The exemplar model is when a person forms concepts by making a list of essential characteristics of broad concepts. And the prototype model is when a person forms concepts based on the least common denominator, like mathematics, least common denominator. For instance, what is the typical type of bird in this area that we live in? So that's the prototype. The prototype average type of bird in this area is the size and shape of a robin, not the color of the robin but the size and shape of one. If you live at the beach, I live in Elizabeth City, so that's a robin, but at the beach, you could have a concept that's a little bit different. The, the typical prototype is a seagull, which is nothing like a robin. And if you live in Australia, it might be the ostrich as the prototype or the kookaburra, and they're nothing like either one of our kinds of birds that we have here. So prototype model is also dependent on where you live. Again, this is a cultural thing, phenomenon, and that's exactly what you're supposed to be talking about in your essays, are cultural phenomenons, differences between cultures. Here is a concept hierarchy. Uh, this is supposed to say animal at the top, not anima. <laughs> we'll talk about anima in other classes, but animal an animal has skin, it eats, and it breathes. That's pretty basic. And it's important that the upper area, upper concept, is very basic because nothing should break any concept above it. If you have a rule, uh, a definition, then the definitions below should not break the definition above. So you need to be very normal or generalized. As you go down, you get more specific. Then you can break animal into a bird or a fish. Okay, so birds have wings, they can fly, and they have feathers. A fish has fins, it can swim, and it has gills. Now we break a bird down into canary and ostrich. So the canary can sing and it's yellow, and the ostrich can't fly, and it's tall. Well, now you just broke a requirement of bird. Bird had a requirement that says it can fly. So this is impossible. You cannot do this in our concept hierarchy. It's called normalizing a database or normalizing the hierarchy. And our brain does this. It automatically pulls in information, and we assume it's correct. When, and they conflict, and the, conf, and the confliction should not occur. So we cannot have can fly with birds. We also, in this particular case, we, we wouldn't see it, but it, we also... Um, would have a problem with feathers because although a penguin does have feathers when it's born, it has no feathers when it, by the time it's an adult and it doesn't fly either. In fact, it swims. So really big differences in the way that we define birds. The ostrich is interesting because, uh, not the ostrich, the canary is interesting because it sings. Well, gee, every bird I know sings. The kookaburra's song is very beautiful. Uh, and so can sing really doesn't define canary well. It, you need a definition that will define canary other than something that would define every other bird as well. And then is yellow. Well, there are plenty of other colors of canaries, although in the United States on the East Coast, we don't normally just see the yellow. But it's like, uh, like hummingbirds on the East Coast. They're very bland, red and green. But in 
on the west coast, oh my gosh, they have so many different colors of hummingbirds. So is yellow really doesn't define canary very well. On the fish side, we have it has fins, can swim, and has gills, and then we break it down into a shark and a salmon. Again, um, it should say salmon. I was playing around with it just a little while ago and messed it up, but uh, the salmon is pink and it's edible. Well, gee, every fish is edible. That's not possible. You can't just say the salmon is edible. It's a bad definition for salmon because it fits all fish. Even the fish that are poisonous, parts of that fish are edible. The lionfish or the pufferfish, there are parts of it that are edible. There are other parts that will kill you, but they're all edible in some way, shape, or form. And then there's the shark. It can bite and it's dangerous. Well, gee, yeah, so is the piranha. <laughs> so it's not a very good definition of the shark. Plus, sharks are also edible. Have any of you ever had shark fin soup? Anybody in the class? Yes or no? Have you had shark fin soup? No, it's very good. Uh, of course, I lived in Japan, so I've had shark fin, shark fin soup and other types of strange delicacies that no one would actually know here in the United States. We all know sushi in the United States, but I've had Inari sushi, which is a very different type of sushi uh, in the city of Inari. So we have to be very careful of our own concept hierarchies that are defined in our brain because our memories are only an outline, and that's what a concept hierarchy is. It's an outline, and we pull up that outline and fill it in, and a lot of times we fill it in with information that is controversial to the upper levels of the concept and break the concept or are so generalized that they fill in and you can be used for anything. So we've got to be very careful of the way we think and the way we pass judgments and make good, proper problem-solving techniques. Basically, what we're trying to show you is don't jump to conclusions. When you pull up a concept hierarchy in your head, you've got to think about it. So the imaginary and cognitive uh, maps, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and most of my relatives were from Philadelphia and I have some Chicago, and my wife is Detroit, but now my relatives are all over the country, and even in different countries in the world now, I have relatives everywhere now. Uh, but I can see, if I think about it, I can see Philadelphia in my head. I can see the patterns, the main street down the middle of Philadelphia. I can see how to get to different places in Philadelphia. I know where my relatives are. I see the streets. I'm, I have this map in my head. And some people are really good at that. If I drive one place, if I physically drive the car to a particular location, the first time I do it, I'll need directions, but I will never need it again. They're in my head after that. I'm really good with geography head maps. My wife, on the other hand, she would need a GPS every time she goes somewhere. So that's visual thinking. And there are cultural influences on visual thinking. Again, this is part of the differences between cultures, which is what your particular essay is about. But I've shown you the boat and the reason why uh, people in Israel would see the boat differently than we do here in the United States, because they read from right to left. So they see their world from right to left, and we read from left to right. So we see our world in left to right as well. But even this is, there's some very egocentric means of looking at the world too. For instance, Children who are able to draw a good circle at four years of age, they're very good at precise drawing circles, most of them. I still can't draw a good circle. But the uh, circle then can be representative of the world, and we ask them to draw a map of the world if they had any references at all. What, they'll, what they will do is they will draw their country right in the middle of the world. As adults, we know that's not correct. Meridian England is the middle of the world and then everything goes out from there because that is the prime meridian that is the date line, the starting date line that's been accepted by the, the UN, United Nations. So how do you draw the world, right? How do you draw the world? 
Uh, I like to tease people as, you know, in everywhere in the world, we'll draw our country right in the middle, except in Russia. They'll draw their country perfectly because as far as they're concerned, they own the world anyway. <laughs> So the tools for studying thought, of course, are the EEG and other functional MRIs and DPIs and DTIs and all kinds of computer-related types of methods of looking at the brain now. We still don't have it perfect. We still don't know exactly what it is, but at least we're better than it was when it was just an EEG wave pattern because the wave pattern was very similar to just uh, a Morse code SOS. Well, you know somebody's in trouble because you see SOS, but you have no idea what the trouble is, how dangerous it is, how anxious they are. None of that information is coming through. And it's like that for an EEG, just, just the plain EEG. But today we have lots more information to be able to see what a particular word means to a per particular person, how a person reacts to it emotionally and what they're what they uh, remember, the visual cues of it, if they have emotional cues of it, if they have sounds when you hear the sound, we can see their brain react in the uh, temporal lobes. Schemes are either broad or narrow, and we talked in the development chapter about schemes and changing a scheme, putting things into a scheme, or taking, or being able to change the scheme to incorporate new information, which was called assimilation or accommodation. And the scheme is that most knowledge that you have is stored in these schemes, which are clusters of related concepts to provide a general framework of the world, which gives you a certain expectation of how the world's going to work. So these frameworks provide expectations about topics, events, objects, people, situations in your life, but they're not always very good at it. Stereotypes, we all know what that means, that the stereotype is a scheme that doesn't really hold water. And we have a reasonable expectation of behavior from others who share our scripts. So a script is a part of a scheme that says exactly what you're supposed to do in a particular given situation. So a cluster of knowledge about sequence of events and actions expected to occur in particular situations. And the example might be driving on the right side of the road for us here in the United States. But if you try to use that script in England, you're going to be in trouble because they drive on the left side of the road, as well as almost every other nation in the world. We're the ones that are weird here in the United States. We tend to like to... to hang around people who have our scripts. If you're driving behind somebody and you've been a driver for a long time, you have a reasonable expectation to assume that person is not going to slam on their brakes for no reason whatsoever. But if you're driving down the road and you see a deer coming out of the forest ahead of you that, and ahead of that person, you have a reasonable expectation that there might be an accident to occur and you'll slow down because of your reasonable expectation of the things that you know about in the world. So different socioeconomic and sociocultural scripts make us uncomfortable around each other. Uh, for instance, as an example, goths and emos. Uh, they used to be called goths in my time. Today they're called emos. They're very different. They wear dark clothes. They're very dark, depressed people, uh, and they like very specific music. And you know, like, I'm not too comfortable around an emo. Now, I happen to love goths and emos, but they're very different. And if you're not used to that particular type of person, you sort of, I'm going on the other side of the road. You know, I'm going to walk the sidewalk on the other side of the road as they come down the road towards you. So that's a feeling a little bit insecure around people that we're not sure what their scripts are. Well, get to know their scripts, and you'll be much better off. You won't feel as uncomfortable around them because we don't like to make others uncomfortable, and we don't like to be uncomfortable way more ourselves. We don't like to be uncomfortable. So we are comfortable when we have an expectation of the behavior in the world around us, which means we are comfortable around people who share our scripts. You might assume, since I'm white, that I uh, might have white skin, 
that I share your scripts because you are white. And then you find out you, when you're, you know, hanging around me all of a sudden, you find out I don't eat pork. Well, what's that about? You know, I don't eat crayfish. I don't eat lobster. I don't eat, you know, shellfish. What's that about? Because I might have white skin, but I'm Jewish. And that makes it, you know, oh, what, oh. So you assumed that I had the same script as you because you look at a white person and say, oh, that white person has the same scripts as me. No. <laughs> go, to, go, to, go to California and find that out. They have very different scripts in California than they do here in the southern parts of the states on the East Coast. So... We tend to self-segregate. We hang around people who are, we assume, like us. When I went to the University of Georgia, they had a number of cafeterias, and they have like thousands of people there at the University of Georgia, 25,000 people in undergraduate school alone. And uh, Ohio State's even bigger. That's the reason I didn't go to Ohio State. I had been accepted there, but oh my gosh, too many people. So uh, University of Georgia went in the cafeteria. And I see there's a table over here. Now, there's hundreds of people in the cafeteria. And there's one table full of African Americans. There's one table full of emos, goths. There's a whole table full of people with studs in their noses and their eyebrows and their lips and their, you know, ears. And they have, they have spiky, you know, colored hair. And they're all hanging out together, right? And there's tables of people who speak specific languages. You know, the Russians are over here, and the Germans are over here, and the French are over here. And what we do when we go into the, we're like, I'm going to sit by myself, or I'm going to find a group that I think has the same scripts as I do, so I don't feel uncomfortable. Now, me, <laughs> I'd go sit with the emos. i go sit with other, you know, any group. I, didn't, so I want to know about them. I want to get to know those people. In fact, I had sat at one table. It was everybody at the table spoke different languages except me. I only spoke English at that time. And so I was like, what am I? The guy next to me, he speaks, he speaks English and German. The guy next to him speaks German and French. The guy next to him speaks French and Russian. And, then, and so I'd say something to go around the table in different languages. And then somebody else would say something to go around the table, come back to me in English. So it was really cool to, to sit there and get to know these people. If you get to know other people, then you get to know their scripts, you learn their scripts. And yeah, it's a little uncomfortable at first, but make sure they understand. I don't know your script and I'm here to just get to know you. And eventually you're not uncomfortable around those people anymore but we self-segregate, which keeps us from getting to know other people's scripts. So we are comfortable around others like ourselves, and if we got to know other people's scripts, we'd feel okay being around them. We have uh, expectations of the world, and then something changes, and we have a reasonable degree of expectation, but occasionally our assumption is incorrect, and when this happens, a good thinker will adapt, improvise, and overcome. This is a saying, a motto, for a very specific group here in the United States. Does anybody uh, recognize the adapt, improvise, and overcome? Do I have anybody in the class that has been through that particular group's indoctrination? I see a no. I don't see any yeses. I only see one no. Are you all there? Do you recognize this? Adapt, improvise, and overcome. Ah, there's a military person. It is part of the United States military. Which one? It turns out to be the motto of the United States Marines because they're always sent somewhere to do something and never given what they need to do it, so they have to adapt, improvise, and overcome. My uh, stepfather's a Marine, gunny sergeant, about the highest you can get without being an officer. So if you're a good thinker, you can adapt, improvise, and overcome. Find the things that can help you to accomplish the task that you need. 
So identifying the problem is a very important aspect. You need to know what the problem is. A good thinker will consider all the options in determining what the problem is rather than just jumping at a conclusion that this must be the problem. Experience and learning from mistakes and increase, increases your ability to come up with a correct decision on what the problem is and how to solve that problem. So you have to make mistakes in life. It is okay to make mistakes. Nobody is perfect. Perfection is overrated. There's no such thing as perfection because as soon as you become the person who can do the job better than anybody else, eventually there's somebody that can do it better than you. And so we, perfection is a moving target. And my father used to say, 99% is good enough that 1% costs too much energy, too much time, and too much money to get to. And he was a value engineer. So identifying the problem. You have to select a strategy to solve the problem too. So we use both algorithms and heuristics, which I will talk about, to select a strategy for solving a problem. And the more experience you have with solving problems, the more heuristics you have and the more algorithms you have. You learn as you make mistakes and as you solve problems, you learn what causes a problem and what, what solves a problem. And good thinkers not only have a repertoire of the effective algorithms and heuristics, but they also know how to avoid the common mistakes we make, the impediments to problem solving and decision making, and we'll talk about those in this section as well. So what is an algorithm? This is a rule, of the, a rule, a formula, a procedure that always guarantees a success. So let me draw something for you on the screen here. Let me find the annotation and, and draw a little thing on the screen. All right, you recognize a right triangle. You all recognize the right triangle? It has a 90 degree, right? It has a 90 degree angle in it, and then it has three sides. You all recognize that, right? There are all kinds of other triangles, but this is called a right triangle. If you have a right triangle, there is a mathematical formula for figuring out the sides, isn't there? Do you all know what that mathematical formula is called or what it is? You don't have to spell it right, but do you remember what it's called? Yes, there we go. We have uh, uh, who? Anna and Quinn. No, Anna. Anna said, Quinn's having problems with his computer. Anna said the Pythagorean theorem. That is correct. What is the Pythagorean theorem then? The Pythagorean theorem is a squared. Let me see. A squared. If I could do this. A squared plus B squared <laughs> equals C squared. There we go, plus, that's a plus, right? All right, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. c squared is always the slope. a and b are the two sides. If you know any, if you know b and c, you can figure out a. If you know uh, a and c, you can figure out b. And if you have a and b, you can figure out c. You get that, right? Every single time it will work. It's an algorithm. It's a mathematical formula. If you use it correctly, it will solve the problem for you. That's what an algorithm is. That's the definition of an algorithm. It always works guaranteed if you use it correctly. Now, can, a, can the Pythagorean theorem, can the Pythagorean theorem find the radius of a circle. Can the Pythagorean theorem find, is that what it's defined for, right? Can it find the radius of a circle? And I'm getting a whole bunch of the same things I get in every other class. The answer, no. That's not what it's for. Are you 
Sure. <laughs> right? So, yeah, the Pythagorean theorem can find the center of a circle in a very specific instance. And, in fact, you don't need to know but one side. Uh, uh, you, need, you only need to know one side because if you know this side right here, it is. But if you only know this side, you only know the slope. If you only know the slope, the other two are identical identical. So it's actually a squared plus a squared equals c squared in this particular instance. But this is the only time I can imagine that you would be able to use the Pythagorean theorem to find the, uh, something other than the, the slope, the, the sides of a triangle. Yes, this is the sides of a triangle also, but it's also the radius of the circle at that particular point. Right? Did you get that? And this is basically calculus now we're getting into. <laughs> Didn't think this was a, a math class, did you? So that is how we use algorithms. Now, heuristics are rules of thumb. I before E except after C or in sounding like A as a neighboring way. Works most of the time, but there are times when it doesn't work. So it's a cognitive strategy, a thought process that has been used before. I remember this particular problem, and I knew how to solve it. And this new problem is almost identical to that old problem, so let's try the solution to that old problem and see if it works in this new problem. And many times it will work, but sometimes it doesn't. Heuristics do not always work. They're not guaranteed to solve a problem, but they're a good starting point if you know something about a particular problem and relate it to a different problem that you already know how to solve the answer, solve the problem. Some common heuristics are searching for analogies, which is an analogy, is a strategy for finding a similarity between a new situation and an older one. Is this situation similar to another one which you already know how to fix? And breaking a big problem into smaller problems. So just because you have a particular problem doesn't mean you can't possibly break it into smaller pieces, especially in mathematics you can but then, then you're talking about algorithms instead of heuristics. But, let's, but if you're getting into really high math, well then, well, I solved this mathematical problem using that algorithm. I wonder if that algorithm works with this problem that I'm looking at. So that, then you're trying to use it as a heuristic. Uh, but because you don't know if it's the right algorithm for the right job. If you use an algorithm correctly, it works. If you don't, so breaking this big problem into smaller problems might solve the problem if you can solve all the little problems together. Can the problem be represented by smaller, less complicated problems? And if you can solve each of the less complicated issues, then you may solve the larger one. And there's the working backward heuristic as well. Working backwards means why look at something from the front end where you are to where you want to get to? Think about where you want to get to and try to get back to where you are instead. And one of the ones that every single one of you will probably recognize is the maze. With a rat usually on the outside trying to get to the cheese on the inside. That's the way they are designed so that you go from the outside into the maze. And because they're always designed from the outside in, all of the little traps to get you to go the wrong way are designed for going in, but going out, it turns out to be much easier because the person who designed it didn't try to make all those little traps going out, so there's only one way to get out of the maze, but there's lots of ways into the maze that get you stuck. <laughs> and so uh, working backwards is sometimes much better. Also, we can get stuck in a particular mental set or have functional fixedness or self-imposed limitations or faulty heuristics, which we'll talk about also. So the, the mental set is a standard approach that's proved successful in the past, and it creates this idea that this is the way to solve this problem. We have the tendency to respond to a new problem in a manner used to, the, to fix the previous problem. So I, I have a great example of this, and there's actually a good there's a, 
what is it, insurance company commercial that actually does something like this. But this actually happened to me. So I had a mental set. I have a one acre piece of property. It's mostly woods, but I have uh, three gardens on it. And I have a, a hose that I walk around and I water my gardens. And I do it every day so that they're properly watered. And if the hose gets stuck on something, I don't want to keep walking all the way back to find out what it's on. If I yank it, it usually comes loose. It comes loose. And it's been, it was on a, stuck on a rock or stuck on a, a root that was sticking out on somewhere because I have a forest here, like lots of trees, so lots of roots. And so my mental set is, if the hose gets stuck, pull it, yank it, and it'll come loose. And it works every single time. Well, we took down some trees last year, and I put up a new, a, a new um, garden. And it was near the edge of my property. And that first summer, when I started watering my gardens, uh, I had this new garden out there. So I was pulling the hose out to the new garden, and it got stuck. And so I yanked it. It didn't come loose. Now, it's supposed to come loose. I have this mental set. It comes, it's supposed to come loose. Yank it again. It still didn't come loose. Well, that's not right. So I yanked it harder. And now I'm getting mad at it because this is supposed to work. This is the mental set. So I wrapped my hands around the hose, my arm, and I yanked that thing right out of the wall because the variables had changed. It was not caught. It was at the end of the hose because I had put the garden way out in the end of the property and the hose wasn't long enough to reach there and it cost me over $150 to fix the faucet that I pulled out of the wall. <laughs> That's a mental set. So now I have a longer hose <laughs> and it still works now. The mental set still continues to work as long as that hose <laughs> is long enough. It, it, when it gets caught now, I can still pull on it, but I'm a lot more careful about it now. <laughs> so that's a mental step. That's a mental set. Functional fixedness is having a particular function for a particular item. So you assign one and only one use for an object. A dime is to be used to pay for things. That's what it's used for. And I'm trying to open up an electric outlet and it has a flathead screw and I don't have a flathead screwdriver so I'm taking my dimes to the store to buy a stupid flathead screwdriver so I can open this flathead screw because you can't possibly use a dime as anything other than money and yet the dime is the perfect flathead screw it fits right into the flathead of a screw and has good torque to open up so a dime is a flat head screwdriver. You can use it as a screwdriver, but people just, they can't imagine the difference and that will talk about the difference between um, divergent and convergent thinking. The ability, functional fixedness is a very convergent thought process. This is what it's for and that's the only thing it's for when in fact divergent thinking you can think of all kinds of different things. Also, um, we, when we're trying to get these words unscrambled from all these letters that are here, the first one is linen, linen, and what we find is that the next word follows the same pattern and the next word follows the same pattern and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and then all those. By the time you get into this group here, you are so stuck on the pattern that you don't see the other words that these letters could represent. You get stuck in a fixed pattern, a mental set of how these things are supposed to be done. And you don't see the others. 
This one is a self-imposed limitation. Can you, without lifting your pen from the page, connect all nine dots with only four lines? And the answer is yes, but only if you don't impose your own limitation on it. Thinking outside the box, the pink is not the page. I did not define what the page was. I just said without lifting your pen from the page. And most people will consider the pink section or the beige section, whatever color you're seeing there, as the page. The whole thing is the page. You can do this if you go use the entire page and think outside the box. There was a great uh, story on Facebook just recently about a professor who had a test coming up and the student said, can we use a cheat sheet? Because he had given them cheat sheets in the past, but this time he didn't give them one. He said, you can make your own cheat sheet. We can make our own cheat sheet? Yeah, eight by 10, or uh, five by eight, sorry, five by eight. Five by eight. Now, he did not say a five by eight card. He did not say five by eight inches. And one of his students came in with a five foot by eight foot piece of paper that she had written all over her cheat sheet information on. I don't know how that turned out eventually, but yeah, she did not have a self-imposed limitation. All the other students said, five by eight card, because that's what they are, little five by eight cards, they assumed that that's what he meant. And he probably did mean that, but he didn't set up the limitation. He just said five by eight. Do you get that? Do you understand? We do this all the time. We set limitations on ourselves. Are you guys there? All right. Yes, it's see lots of yeses. All right. So that's a self-imposed limitation. Just think about the things that you limit yourself on when somebody says to do something and you create this limitation on your own. We have these problems, biases that everybody seems to have that keep us from making proper judgments or um, causing us to denigrate other people in specific ways. So the confirmational bias is the fact that we don't like to be wrong. We hate to be wrong. Nobody likes to be wrong. We like to be right. It makes us feel good. And so we tend to pay attention to those things that confirm our own beliefs and ignore or denigrate those things that do not fit our own feelings and uh, confirm our own beliefs. So we ignore or find fault with information that does not fit our opinion and seek information with which we agree, even if that agreement is only part of the answer. There are two sides to almost all issues, and confirmation bias makes us fixate on all of the parts that confirm our own belief and deny or or denigrate or reduce the um, reduce the value of a particular item that does not fit our own belief system. That's confirmational bias. So when we're trying to solve a problem, we're limited to those things that confirm our beliefs when the answer could be something that doesn't confirm our beliefs. Hindsight bias, hindsight's 2020. How many of you heard that saying before? Hindsight is 2020. Have you heard that saying? Hindsight is 2020. What it means is that when we're looking back into the past, good, Xander doesn't understand, has not heard. In every class, there are people who haven't heard that saying. Hindsight's 2020 means that Hindsight, meaning we're looking back into the past where whatever problem it was was already solved. And we look at that and we know the problem and we also know the solution because it was solved many years ago. And we look at it as though it's like, well, that's obvious. It's so obvious that it, the answer is just too obvious. That's what 2020 means. 
eyesight is the perfect eyesight is 2020, we're looking back on it and we can see, oh, it's obvious what the answer is to this particular issue or problem. But at the time that they were trying to solve the problem, it's not obvious. Einstein found E equals MC squared, but nobody before him knew it. And now today, the physicists are like, well, that's obvious. Yes, it's obvious now that somebody solved the problem already. And what it does is it denigrates people that are living in the past who's, who had to figure these things out because they seem so easy once we know the solution, but it wasn't easy back in the day when they were trying to figure it out. So it's the tendency after learning about an event to believe that you could have predicted that event, that you're just as smart as anybody else, because, but you were told what the answer was. You didn't have to figure it out yourself. But we don't even think that. We just say, oh, that's just, I could have done that. Probably not. And the space shuttle accidents are some of the best examples of this. Nobody expected that foam, foam dropping off of the space shuttle's engine uh, would have hitting the wing of the space shuttle caused so much damage that when it re-entered, it caused the, caused the thing to explode. Who would have thought that? Foam? Really? On metal? Really? And then, of course, the other one is the O-rings. O-rings are made out of metal, and they hold on to the liquid oxygen tanks, and they keep them in place. And the metal of the liquid oxygen tank is different than the metal of the O-ring, and this was the very first time that a shuttle had been launched in freezing weather, and when metal is frozen, it contracts, and when it gets hot, it expands but it expands at different rates and the o-rings expanded faster than the metal that they surrounded and that allowed the liquid oxygen in the tanks to leak out and then be ignited by the engine the wrong way and then the entire thing exploded but who would that's obvious today but back when they were launching the space shuttles over and over and over again and nothing ever went wrong and it was all perfect and good and now all of a sudden the first time you do it in freezing weather it's frozen the metals have have contracted they're still connected to each other but then as they launch off they become very hot and they expanded at different at different rates and it caused this space shuttle to explode. So today we can say, ooh, well that's quite obvious, but not back then. And why were they so stupid back then when they couldn't figure that out? You couldn't have figured it out either, but that's what hindsight is all about. Hindsight 2020. We look at it in the past and go, I could have done that. No, most likely you couldn't have. The anchoring bias is a faulty heuristic caused by basing, anchoring, an estimate on a completely unrelated quantity. So the tendency to give undue weight to evidence which occurs early or most recent or most recently. And eight factorial, we're going back into mathematics again. Eight factorial means is eight exclamation point. I could have 10 factorial, 10 exclamation point, or 20 factorial, 20 exclamation point. The exclamation point means factorial. And what it means in mathematics is to take that number and multiply it by all numbers that come before it up to one. So eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And if I take a class and I tell them, in your heads, you can all work together, but you can't write it down, you can't use a calculator, you have to do it in your heads. Think about it, have one person remember a number and then go to that and continue doing it. And come up with the answer, eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And let me know what the answer is. And then I take a different class, and I say to that class, I want you guys, no paper, no calculator, just want to do it in your heads. You can all work together, but I want you to do one times two times three times four times five times six times seven times eight. It's the exact same number. It should be. But the class that starts off 
with eight times seven times six starts off with a huge number. They are anchored in a very large number. The group that starts off one times two times three starts off with a really tiny number. And in most cases, what will happen is the group that's anchored in the large number will come up with an answer that's larger than the group that's anchored in the smaller number. That's the anchoring bias. We tend to anchor stuff and it's, that shouldn't be. Eight times seven is only part of, it's not the whole thing, but we tend to think that it's going to be a big number or it's going to be a small number. <laughs> so our legal system does this. Our legal system gives the prosecution the first attempt at proving to the jury that this person on trial is guilty. We anchor the jury in guilt. Then we let the defense come up and try to break that guilt and prove innocence. Why would we do this? Why? Does anybody have any, any idea why we would let prosecution go first. There's a very good reason. There's a very good reason for this. Does anybody have a clue as to why the prosecution gets to go first? Dum, 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 dum. Anna says, no idea. Don't know. Quinn says, Xander, no clue. You all know the answer to this. <laughs> Every one of you that's a U.S. citizen knows this because we're all taught this from childhood. And the jury already is anchored. Before they ever get to trial, the jury is already anchored because every single one of us is anchored, or should be, especially police officers. We have a saying in the United States, you are innocent until proven guilty. So every single juror should be already anchored in innocence. And if the defense got to come up first, they would really cement the idea of innocence and the prosecution would have no, choice, no chance of showing guilt. So we're all anchored in, you are innocent until somebody proves you're guilty. Now the, now the prosecution gets to come up and say, this is the reason why he's guilty. Then the defense gets to come up and break that, get back to the innocent again. And that's why the legal system does this. We are all already anchored in innocence until proven guilty. At least we should be, especially police officers. It's not their job to decide if you are innocent or guilty. It's just your job to get you to court. That's their job, to catch you and get you to court so that the court can determine whether you are guilty or innocent. So representative bias. Representative bias is a stereotype. Right? We all have stereotypes. We all know this works this way, and so anything that's like it must work the same way. Right? It's almost very much like a mental set. A faulty heuristic strategy based on presumptions that once a person or an event is categorized, it shares all the features of other members of that category. How many of you know someone who is and Asian, of Asian descent, and especially in college, if, you've, if you know other people in your class, and they're really good at math, really good at math. So I guess all Asians must be really good at math. No. <laughs> the Asians who get to come over here to go to school are good at math because the reason they are able to come over here is because they're good at math. There are really stupid Asians who don't know anything about math, just like there are stupid Americans who know nothing about math and smart Americans who know about math. Uh, blondes have more fun. That's one of my favorites. Blondes have more fun. You know that there's actually research that shows that? 
Have you heard of this research? Research that shows that blondes do have more fun. You haven't heard of this. I wouldn't have expected you to. I've been told I'm nice for someone with tattoos. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great stereotype. People with tattoos are just, they're mean or there's something wrong with them. Right? No, 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 no. <laughs> I love that, Anna. <laughs> so blondes have more fun. What they did was they took uh, a redhead, a brunette, a blonde, and a raven girl. Raven means black hair. Uh, to a bar. They were all rated as um, eights, every single one of them. They were all dressed the same. So they went to the bar and they took uh, the notice of which ones had what kind of interactions. So the blondes had more people talking to them, more of the guys talked to the blondes, more um, drinks were, were offered to the blondes, more dances, they got to dance more often than any of the other girls. Blondes had more fun. Then they went and asked the men, why did you ask this girl to dance? Or why did you buy this girl a drink? Or why did you talk to this girl? And why didn't you talk to, you know, this other girl over here? And the answers were, redheads are mean. I'm not talking to the redhead. Redheads are mean. <laughs> it's just not true. Okay. And blondes, blondes have more fun. So I want to have fun. So I'm asking the blonde out and I'm asking the blonde to dance because if I ask the blonde to dance, I'll have more fun too. And so it was the it was the stereotype that caused the stereotype to be correct. Men went to the blondes more often because men expected to have more fun with the blondes because blondes have more fun. Plus, the blondes had more fun because the guys would do things with them or ask them out to do things that are more fun to do. And, you know, uh, a raven girl is more serious. You know, black-haired girls, they're real serious. So you can't really have fun time with them, but you can go out with them, you know, do things, but you, you, they're not really fun things, right? <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, so this is a faulty heuristic, a representative bias, a bias that this person fits this particular category and that category means this, and that's not necessarily the case. And then the availability bias. Our brain is, is a hierarchy. Our memory is a hierarchy. When we pull up the outline of our brain, we fill it in with all kinds of stuff. Well, you saw we have problems with hierarchies and the way we fill in the information. And this is a faulty heuristic strategy that estimates probabilities based on information that can be recalled from personal experience. But we are not parallel thinkers. We think in a straight line, serially. So we all, always, no matter what, every categorization scheme that you can think of starts one way and ends another way. So there's always a flow of information. The stuff at the end of the line is the last thing you're going to think of. The stuff at the beginning of the line is the first thing you think of. Whether it's the right answer or not, it's still the first thing you think of. So any kind of categorization scheme favors some searches over other searches and the retrieval structure, the fact that we can retrieve something fast the availability of that information makes it look like it's correct, but that's not the way it is. That's not the way it is. And divergent and convergent thinking are two ways that um, we can think about the world. So in 1950s, a psychologist named Guilford defined these two approaches to the way we think, and we solve problems, divergent and convergent thinking. Creativity, as far as he was concerned, Hat was correlated with people who were divergent thinkers. And a divergent thinker is someone who comes up with lots of different ways to solve a problem. And in business, this is called brainstorming. The boss comes in and says, we have this problem. We need to solve the problem. Let's get together tomorrow and come up with as many ideas as you can to solve the problem. Every idea is OK in a brainstorming session. No matter how stupid it sounds, no matter how incredibly ignorant it sounds, 
every idea is okay because that's what brainstorming is all about. This stupid idea may have a little piece of an idea that of it that will connect with another stupid idea's little piece, and those connections may end up giving you a solution. It wasn't those stupid ideas, but a piece of them that finally came together. And that's divergent thinking, coming up with as much information as you can in order to come up with the final solution, whatever that solution is, and recognizing that the final solution may not be the only possible solution. There could be other solutions as well. And you could come up with four or five different solutions that work. Now you have to determine which one of those you're going to try. And if that doesn't, well, you've got three others that you can try. So there's a great poem I like to use for this as an example. I came upon a fork in the road and the poem says, I took the one less traveled. Well, you know, what else could you say instead of I took the one less traveled? You could say I took the one most traveled because I don't like to be different from other people. So I just took the one that everybody else takes. Or, I'm so different from everybody else that I came upon a fork in the road and I made my own fork. I'm not, I made my own path. I'm not going to follow other people. I'm going to make the way, my own way through the world. Or, I came upon a fork in the road and this is good because I already had a spoon and a knife and I needed a fork. <laughs> it's just a completely different meaning of the word fork, but still fits. Right? You can actually picture that in your head. So this is... A good, a good way to describe con, uh, divergent thinking. And convergent thinking is like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. It doesn't matter how you want to put it together. There's only one solution to a jigsaw puzzle. Only one. They only fit together one way to give you the pattern that is on the box top, whatever it is. And there are people who are, who are just they are adamant that there is only one way to solve a problem, and this is the way, my way. They are very convergent thinkers. They refuse to think divergently. How um, a brick is used to build a building, a brick. You know what bricks are. Uh, bricks can build a house. They can build two-story houses, one-story houses, they can build out houses, you know. Besides building a building, what else is a brick good for? Divergent thinking. What else is a brick good for? What can you do with a brick? Type it in. What would you do with a brick that was different than building? Throw it! So why are you throwing it? Are you throwing it in order to build up muscles? Is that where you're throwing it? Because certainly a brick weighs, so it's exercise. You can use it as a weight, exercise weight, right? You can hammer a nail with it. Excellent. Oh, that's great. You can use it as a hammer. I haven't had that one in a while. Hammering a nail with it. Very good, Lauren. What else can you do with a brick? Use it as a platform to keep other things off the ground. Ooh, Anna, that's a good one too. Yes. What else? Uh, ground up the brick dust is used in voodoo and witchcraft. <laughs> voodoo. Voodoo and witchcraft. Yes. <laughs> I did not know that it could be used for that purpose. Uh, oh, I love that one, Xander, because I always get that one. You can hit somebody over the head with it and kill them. Absolutely. You can use it as a weapon. It is a weapon. Try to kill someone with it. Uh, and Ava, use it as an anchor for something. Well, I'll give you a, a closer than that. Uh, and every construction site, there's always wind, and you're trying to look at the construction papers, and so you use the bricks as paperweights to hold the things down. So anchor for something to hold the weight, to hold the papers down. Every construction site uses them for that purpose, yes. It can also be a lock, key. I locked my keys in the house. I took a brick and broke the window to get in. <laughs> this is divergent thinking. How to use things different ways, how to do things differently, 
And there are people who are really good at divergent thinking, and there are people who are very stuck at convergent thinking. I, this is the way it has to be, and it all has to come down to a particular answer. And there's only one right answer. And there are lots of bosses like that, and you don't want to work for one like that. Uh, bosses that do that are hard to deal with. So intelligence testing has a history of controversy, but most psychologists now view intelligence as a normally distributed trait that can be measured by performance in a variety of tasks, both verbal and nonverbal. It is very controversial, IQ. The IQ stands for intelligence quotient. But is it really an intelligence test? And we'll see that it is not actually an intelligence test. It's called the Binet Simon test in France in 1904. Remember what else is happening in 1905 and 4 is Pavlov and behaviorism. John Watson are both creating the ideas of science in psychology. And so 1904, the French government decides to make education mandatory and to split up the, the classes into the normal and fast growing and the slower students. The slower students need more help. And so they're put into classes where they can get that help, whereas in the, the people who are normal and fast learners, they, can, they don't need as much help. We do the exact opposite here in the United States. We put everybody together. So they needed to, a method to determine where to place the children. And how much does a child know? So they decided to take the test and to determine whether the child, they had to figure out, do we place them just because of their age? Obviously, that would not work. Or their mental age, chronological age versus mental age. Can you guys define, somebody in the class, in the, can you define what chronological age is? How many years since your birth? Very, very good. Chronological age, Anna. And that is what most Americans believe. But in Korea and, what's this one, uh, Morgan, determining how mature you are based on how old you are. No, it has nothing to do with mat maturity. It's just age. It's just how many years you've been on this earth. But the American Indians and South Korea, both, when you're born, you are one year old because you've been in the womb for at least nine months, and that is part of your age. Completely different than the way that we mostly think about it in the United States. But imagine this. Doesn't matter when you were born. In the United States, we say you're 18, right? And you become an adult, can do adult things. And at 21, you can do even more things. And Koreans get to be 18 and 21 one year before you do. So they get to be an adult. If they're here in the United States, they get to do the adult things a year before you do. And here is another example that you can use on your essay about cultural differences. This makes a big difference. One year makes a big difference, doesn't it? Wouldn't you have liked to have done some of the things you could do at 21, at 20 instead? So chronological age, it's, it seems like that is, that it means something to us and we think, oh, that's the way it must mean for everybody. No, 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 no. There's so many things in the world that are not the way you and I see it, Horatio. So mental age is how much you know compared to all the people your age. And it is definitely a normal distribution curve. So Alfred Binet developed the test with help from Theodore Simon. And then they had thousands of people all over France giving these tests to children. One of those people giving the tests was a young man named Jean Piaget. And Jean Piaget, we've already talked about, he would administer the test just like everybody else was administering the test, but he's a scientist at heart. He's mentally, he's completely different, thinks differently. So he asks the child, because there's, there's a question on the test, how does the wind blow? Why does the wind blow? And little children, five and six years of age, will say, well, the trees make the wind blow. 
and all the other people, they would just write down the trees make the wind blow. And Sean would write, would, he'd write it down, but then he'd say, explain to me what you mean by the trees make the wind blow. And the little kids would go, well, you know, you can, you see, they, they're like, can you feel the air blowing? <laughs> That's intelligent. They see the trees moving and they think that the trees cause the wind because they don't have all the data, but they have put together in their own head certain facts about the world. They don't know all the facts yet, but the facts they do have, they have put it together in some way, shape, or form that makes sense to them. So he says, wow, children really think. They're little scientists. And that's why he came up with his ideas for cognitive development. Now, Henry Goddard in the United States took this test and translated it into English and then, and then changed it slightly for a very specific purpose to prove that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were smarter than all other races and anybody from another country, that people from Poland are idiots, that people from Spain and France are a little smarter than that, and people from England are much smarter than that, and African Americans are just stupid. And he did this by putting in information from a magazine that was a very expensive magazine of the time, and no one that was poor in the United States, um, mostly African Americans and some poor white people, but they didn't know the answers to this because they never read that magazine. It was a stupid test, really, really racist test. Yerkes actually got the government to use the test in World War I to prove who should be the officers and who should be the foot soldiers who should use the expensive equipment and who should be the fodder for the, um, for the bullets of our enemies. And it turned out that when they did this test, they found that those people who were new to America, who, had, who are new citizens, who hadn't learned English very well yet, they did really poorly. So that showed that people from other countries were stupid. And, and all those people who were poor were also pretty stupid because they couldn't answer the questions. How would you answer, if I asked you a question on a test, where'd you leave your tuchus? Where's your tuchus right now? How many of you would be able to answer that question? Anybody? Nope. Oh, one person would. Good girl, Anna. Yeah, no. Anybody else? Could you answer it? Where's your tuchus? It's in your pants. You're sitting on it. It's your ass. <laughs> and it is the Yiddish word for ass. And I happen to know that because when I was growing up, I had relatives who spoke Yiddish. Right? So I know what it means. But does that mean that you're stupid because you don't know what it means? No, it means you haven't had the experiences that I've had. Well, how do I know what experiences you've had? How can I possibly make a test to test the experiences and the knowledge you have when I don't know your experiences. And poverty is a really big issue because people in poverty do not have the same experiences. In fact, a person in poverty could make a test that none of us would probably be able to, to solve. We wouldn't be able to pass the test because they know things that we just don't know. And I think I've told you this story already, but um, yeah, I'm positive I've told you this story already. But when I met my wife, she did not know flowers. She was like, oh, that's a pretty flower. That's a rose. Oh, that's a pretty flower. That's a peony. Oh, that's a pretty flower. That's a tulip. And I had this really beautiful plant. Oh, my gosh, your plant, it's flowering. It's flowering. Yeah, it's a bird of paradise. It flowers. They, they do flower. And they're gorgeous flowers. I'm like, what's wrong with this girl? She doesn't know anything about flowers. But then we went down to the beach, which is where she lives, and I picked up a shell, and I said, oh, what a pretty shell, and she said, snark-eyed moon snail, because she knew every single shell on the beach. She could name them all and tell you what kind of creature lived in them, too. I couldn't. Am I stupid because I don't know the shells? Is she stupid because she doesn't know flowers? My mom was a florist. Of course I know flowers. 
So experience is a big deal. How much experience do you have? What do you know? Is it the same type of experience that's being asked for on an IQ test? And today, of course, they're trying very hard to make the IQ tests as generalized as possible so that the majority of people know the data that's on the test, but that doesn't mean everybody does. There is part, uh, part of a test that you are shown pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Again, I hate jigsaw puzzles, but it's a jigsaw puzzle, and you're supposed to put the jigsaw puzzle together. They have a, a blanket over it, and then they take the blanket away and click a, a timer to see how long it takes you to put the jigsaw puzzle together. Well, gosh, there's a trunk. Oh, it's, a, it's an elephant, so I could put the thing together because I know what an elephant looks like. But what about a person who's never seen an elephant before? And how do I know when I'm giving the test if they've even seen it? They don't ask if you've seen an elephant before. Do you know what an elephant is? Because as soon as they do, and I know what an elephant is, I know what I'm looking for as soon as I get to that, as soon as they take the blanket away. So they can't ask that question. So this um, created civilian consequences of people now had reasons for racism. Oh, people from Poland are idiots, idiots. No, they're not. They just don't know English and don't have the access to the things that Goddard had on his test. And that's where Polish jokes come from. You may have heard of Polish jokes. Uh, they were developed. People started picking on the Poles because of how stupid they were on these tests. So the country of origin appeared to determine stupidity, and uh, although they didn't say it, poverty did, and most of the people who were taking the test that were po in poverty going into World War I were African Americans, and so African Americans looked stupid, and that's not the case. So I'm going to stop there and pick it back up again when we come back uh, next time, and if you have any questions, go ahead and stay and talk to me. Otherwise, oh, and if you didn't put your name in, say na your name and here. Make sure that I know you're here. And have a very good um, day and Wednesday, and I'll see you on Thursday. Bye. Stay healthy.